It's a good day to be at church. If you're new to New Hope today, we want to say welcome to New Hope. Take a moment, fill out the connect form attached to your bulletin. You can go to newhope.church slash info for a digital connect card. We have a brand new visitor here with us today. We have Cohen Lane Todd right here. First time visitor at New Hope. Scott and Trish right over there. Parents, come on, welcome this first time visitor right here. Oh, he's got a wave. He's already got the wave down. He's been practicing. Let's go. He's waving the feet, waving the hands. He's ready to go. Welcome to your first Sunday. Man, it is a good day to be at church. Anybody thankful to be at church today? Today we're jumping into a new series. We've been in the series of Genesis for the last 30 years. And today... Today we begin a new series. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to the book of James. Come on, the book of James, chapter 1. Thank you, worship team. James, chapter 1 is where we're diving in today. And if you're taking notes, the title of this morning's sermon is Trial to Triumph. Trial to Triumph. And tonight, I'm going to be continuing the second part of this chapter uh, called Quit Kidding Yourself. Turn around and say, Quit Kidding Yourself. Quit kidding yourself, but this morning we're looking at trial to triumph, and we're in the book of James, the book of James. This book of James was uh, written by James. Good job. You got it. Some of you are like, I think I know, but I don't want to say that. This is a book written by James. We know that James was the the half-brother of Jesus. But James did not believe Jesus was who he said he was until after the resurrection happened. Now, if you want to blame James, just think if your sibling told you the same things that Jesus said about, like, you'd be like, I don't know about, I don't know if that's really who you are. But we know that after James saw Jesus in the resurrection that he believed and that he wrote this book, this is the earliest writing that we have in the New Testament. And James is one of my favorite books of the Bible. If you're looking for a good place, maybe like, I, I'm new to, to following Jesus, or maybe I'm new to reading my Bible. If you're looking for a good place to read in your Bible, it is the book of James. It's one of my favorite places. It's a very practical book, a very clear cut of what we need to do, and I'm excited as we dive into it today. So if you have a Bible, we're going to be starting in chapter 1, verse 2, and it says this, consider it pure joy. Turn over and say pure joy. Pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is so good and that it is alive and that it's speaking to us today. God, I pray that you would uh, speak something new and speak something fresh to us today and that we would respond with a yes to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we're looking at joy. Who in the place would say you would like to have a little bit more joy today? Come on, I think everybody could say, like, I'm never maxed out on joy. Like, I'm always down to have some more joy in my life. And James, he starts off this chapter with saying, consider it joy when you face trials. What a crazy statement to start off a book of the Bible. Consider it joy when you face trials. Can you imagine just living a life that says, whenever I face trials, I have joy. Hey, how's your day going? It's fantastic. I got fired today. (laughs) I'm so excited. Like, consider it joy when you face trials. Joyful trials. It it seems like two things that don't really go together, right? It's almost like you ever thought of crash landing, like crash landing. Did you crash or did you land? (laughs) Joyful trials, it, it doesn't really make sense. He says, consider it joy when you face trials. Not if you face trials, But how many know it's when you face trials? Turn your number and say, you're going to face some trials. It's when you face trials. And he says, trials of many kinds. There's all sorts of different trials, which tells me that we might not all go through the same thing, but we're all going to go through something. There's different trials. There's all sorts of, there's, there's trials of poverty and there's trials of plenty. We all know that being broke can be a battle, but, but the management of resources, if your character is not ready for it, can lead to some serious trials. There's trials of 
being in a, in, in a marriage, there's trials of being single, there's trials of being lonely, there's trials of being in friendship. There's all sorts of trials. And I think as we go through life, we experience these trials and we're like, man, I want to try out some different trials. Like, trials I have, I'm sick of these. Like, you want trade trials? You said rich people trials? Sign me up for two of those, please. Two of those, I'll take them. Someone that's single in the room is like, married people trials? I think I could be pretty good at some married people trials. Like, we look at trials and we think, I, I could handle those trials, but there's all sorts of different trials. There's as many different trials as there are drinks on the menu at Starbucks. There's lots of trials. Lots of things that we can experience. And in, and in this verse, we see that the version I'm reading is the NIV, and it says, when you face trials, but some of you might be reading from the King James, and it says, when you face temptations. There's trials and there's temptations. The original word could be translated to either, but whether we're going through trials or temptations, they kind of look a little bit different. The Bible talks about when we experience temptation that we should resist it, that we should run from it. Multiple verses say flee from that. But trials is something that we should face. So temptations is something we should flee. Trials is something that we should face. I've heard it said that trials come from God to develop us. Temptations come from the devil to destroy us. There's trials and there's temptations. There's two different things here, and we have to know the difference. We have to know that there are some that we need to treat one way and some that we need to treat another way. So how do we know? How do we know the difference between a trial and a temptation? How do we know how I should treat that situation? Because I think lots of Christians today, they, they accept what they should resist and resist what they should accept. We accept the temptation and we resist the trial. While we should be fleeing from that temptation, and we should be accepting that trial. We should be facing that trial. So how do we know? How, how do I know the difference between a trial and a temptation? Prayer helps us to know the difference. Reading my Bible helps me to know the difference. Finding godly people that I can talk to and that can speak into my life helps me know the difference. Wisdom helps me know the difference. Look at what it says here in verse 5 of James chapter 1. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Come on, who in the room needs some more wisdom in your life, right? I don't think we've ever arrived at wisdom. Like, we could always use more wisdom. And notice it doesn't say that whenever you face trials, ask God and he'll get rid of it. It says he's going to give you wisdom. That he's not going to say no when you ask for wisdom. There's a lot of things I've asked God for before, and he says No. But whenever we ask for wisdom, he freely gives it. He gives it. He, he wants to give you wisdom. And, and this helps us to know what is a trial and what is a temptation because these two things are very different. Some of the things that I'm facing in life right now is called having three boys, six and under, okay? There's some trials that go on in my house. Some of the things that some of you are facing is you've got kids going through puberty. <laughs> you can't cast that out. You just got to face it. <laughs> you can anoint it with oil all you want. You're going to have to face it. <laughs> But there are some temptations that come from the devil. There are some things that, that he throws our way that he tries to trip us up on. There's all sorts, there's different trials and there's, there's different temptations. Some of the things we face is because the enemy is trying to attack us. Some of it that we face is because we live in a broken world. Some of it we face is because we make dumb decisions sometimes. And we got to face it. There's difference between trials and temptations. Here's what it says in James chapter 1, uh, verse 13 about temptations. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. See, that temptation, it, it starts with a thought. Are we taking those thoughts captive? Sin many times is caused from us sitting on a thought that we should be fleeing from. It's a thought that leads to an action, an action that leads to a habit, a habit that leads to a lifestyle which determines the direction of your life. The direction of your life, it starts with a thought. What are we doing with those thoughts? Hear me, it's not a sin to have a thought. It's not a sin to be tempted. We know Jesus was tempted, but what are we doing with that temptation? It says that we should flee from it, that we should run from it, that, that we shouldn't sit there and, and explore it, that, that we need to flee from those thoughts. Sin is not something we should play with. Sin, it's dangerous. Anybody ever been to a restaurant before that, that you open up the menu and there's no prices on the menu? 
it's not free, run, okay? <laughs> this is what sin is like. Satan, he gives us this menu and we get to choose and I think if we knew the cost of the sin, we would never take it. It's just, it's, it's, he, he, we ring up the bill and guess what? It's a bill that, that we can't pay. I think many times we play with sin for a little while and soon enough we find out that sin starts playing with us. It's dangerous. It's not a game that you wanna play with. It's, there's a temptation and we have to know what, what to do with these temptations. We have to flee from some of the temptations and we have to face some of the trials. Consider joy when you face trials. Consider joy when you face temptation because it produces perseverance. Come on, who wants some perseverance in the room? Come on, who wants, who wants to be mature and complete like it says in the room? There, it says that there is a difference. There's a difference between trials and temptation, which also tells me this, that there's a difference in the joy that it talks about. There's a difference between joy and pleasure. There's a difference between joy and pleasure. There, there, there's godly joy that we have, but lots of times I think we associate joy to status and success and, and possessions, but it doesn't take long to look at, at the world and to look at celebrities to find that there are people that have everything, that are known by everyone, yet they're still depressed, yet they still commit suicide. Why? Because there's a difference between joy and pleasure. There's a difference there. Joy comes from God. Now hear me, you can enjoy things without having Jesus in it. You don't have to be saved to enjoy Chick-fil-A. You don't have to be a Christian to enjoy Chick-fil-A. Now, it helps that the, the chicken was probably a Christian ahead of time. <laughs> but you don't have to be saved to enjoy Chick-fil-A. You don't have to be saved to enjoy a vacation. But there's a difference in the quality between pleasure and joy. There's a difference there between pleasure and joy. Joy is not dependent on pleasure. Joy is not dependent on happiness. Happiness does not equal joy. Happiness is a feeling. Here's what I want you to see today, that joy, it's a focus. Joy is a decision. Joy is a, it's a mindset. I think so often in our world today, there's this pressure to feel pleasure. Like, I need to feel happy all the time. I think social media is what kind of pushes this forward. We scroll on social media and we see everybody having fun, everybody seems happy all the time, and we compare their highlight reel to our behind the scenes. And it seems like there's a problem with me if I'm, not, if I'm not happy all the time. Guess what? We weren't created to be happy. I'll tell you right now, in a few months, it's gonna be negative 20 degrees outside and I'm gonna be shoveling for the 14th time. I'm not gonna be happy about it. If you find pleasure in shoveling in negative 20 degree weather, talk to me. I've got a driveway waiting for you this winter, okay? But we see that there's a difference there. There's a difference between joy and pleasure and there's this, this pressure that I have to feel joy all the time. But I wanna tell you, it's, it's a decision. It's a mindset. It's not a feeling. I know this because of what Hebrews chapter 12 tells me. Look at what it says in Hebrews 12 verse two. It says, fixing your eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. I wanna ask you a question this morning that I don't want it just to be a, a passing question, but a question that you sit on today. What are you setting before you? What are you setting before you? Because it says here that the joy was set before him, so Jesus endured the cross. I'll tell you what, that there, Jesus did not feel pleasure on the cross. There was no pleasure in the event of the cross, but there was joy in the outcome of the cross. There was not joy in, in, in the, the whipping and the, in the beating and the torture that he went through, but there was joy in the purpose that it brought. That there was pain, but there was purpose to the pain. There's a difference when we experience pain and when we experience pain for a purpose. That there's joy when there's a purpose. If, if, if there's some moms in the room today, you know what I'm talking about because as you have given birth at times to your children, you know that there is pain in the season, but there is joy in the outcome. That there's purpose to that pain. There was purpose to Jesus going, the, the cross was the purpose that Jesus came for. Therefore, when he went to the cross, it might have been uncomfortable, but he said, that doesn't determine my joy. My joy is in the outcome of the cross. Can I tell you that there is joy when you follow the purpose that God has for your life? There is joy in following the purpose. And every single person here today, God has a purpose and a plan and a calling for your life. 
And I think sometimes in church world, we, we narrow that down to like, well, you're only called if you are a pastor or if you're a missionary. But there are some people in here that God has called you to the field that you're at, to the hospital that you're at, to the school that you're at, to the accounting from that, to, to the place that you're at. God has called you to that place. And there's joy in saying yes to that calling. And there are people in here today that I know God has called you places and you've said yes and you know that joy. There are people here today that God has called you places and you've thought, ah, I'm going to wait for the next word from God. <laughs> like, I'm just going to wait to get a word from God that I like. <laughs> How many know if you wait for, to get a word from God that you like, you might be waiting forever. You might never get a word from God that you like. I think there's some people today in the, in the church world that, that treat it like this. Any football fans in the room? Any football fans? A few football fans getting ready for football season? Imagine you're on a football team, all right? Turn to your and say, I'm a, I'm a football player. That's the first time some of you have ever said that your entire life. <laughs> Imagine you're the running back, and there's a call, and, and the call is that it's not getting handed off to you. It's going to someone else, but you have, to, you have to make this block. You have to hit this person, and you know every time you make that block, that person on the team, that they just light you up. They destroy you, and you're like, pass. No, thank you. <laughs> the coach makes the call that that's the play you're supposed to run. You're like, ah, I'm just going to wait for the next one. I'm going to wait to get a, a play that I like. Coach looks over and he sees you. He's like, what, what are you doing? Now, I don't like this play because I get hit. But that play, hear me, that play might be the play that, that our coach wants and that your team needs. I wonder today if there's some, some Christians, some followers of Jesus in the room today that would say, I don't need to be comfortable. I just need to say yes. I, I just want to be in the will of God that, that I might not be comfortable for a moment, but the, the outcome is going to lead me to joy. That if that's what he's called me to, there is joy at the end of this. God has called many people today, and, and you might have missed it in a moment, and you might have missed it in another moment, and you're like, well, I missed it, so I, I, I can't follow that calling anymore. But guess what? We serve a God who's persistent in his calling. You look at, at Scripture, and guess what? He calls young people, and he calls old people. You look at Scripture, and he, he doesn't call one time and say, oh, you missed it. I guess you can't follow that calling. No, he calls over and over and over again. He repeats himself. Why? Because God wants to use you. God wants to use you. I feel like maybe today there's some people that came in, and you have yet to even give God the chance for telling you your calling or for giving you the purpose. And, and you've gone direction that you thought was profitable. You've gone a direction that you thought was going to work out. You, thought you went a direction that you thought was going to bring you happiness. And today, I believe that God wants to speak to you. Today, I believe that as you make yourself available, that God's going to speak. And for me, it's never been like this loud, audible voice. Like I've never heard God like, Zuck! do this deep voice where you're like, that must be God. I've never had that happen. But usually it starts with a thought. I go, that, that thought doesn't seem like something I would just come up with. Come up with. And I go to my Bible and I, I go to people I can trust and I pray about it. And God leads me in that direction. But I believe today that God wants to speak to some people. And here's what I love about God is God doesn't like call you and then hide from you. Like try to find me. It's not like, it's not playing hide and seek with you. Now hear me, God is always moving but he is never hiding. He's always moving. Why? Because he wants you to continue to follow him. He wants you to continue to walk in his direction. He wants you to continue down that path. He's calling you to him. He's not calling you to a calling or, or a purpose. Why? Because he wants you to come to him, not to that thing. But he's always moving, and we have to always be following. There is joy in saying yes to Jesus. There is joy in saying yes to the purpose that he has for us. And I think many times... What happens is we get a call from God and we start to compare. Well, look at that person's call. That, that call seems pretty great. I wish I had that call. Oh, that person got that call? Man, that seems way more fun than my call. And we start to play this game that we're looking side to side to side to side. And we're like, man, I, I wish I had all these. And what did it say that Jesus did? He said he went before him. The joy that was set before him. Not the joy that was to the left of him, to the right of him. Hear me, comparison kills joy. Comparison, it kills contentment. But we have to put our eyes on what's before us. We have to put our eyes on Jesus. Look what it says in Psalm chapter 16. It says, you make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. There is joy in the presence of God. 
That when you walked in today, that when you showed up expecting to encounter God, there was joy in this place because there was the presence of God. But guess what? The presence of God is not just contained to this room, but if you've said yes to Jesus, you have access to the Holy Spirit, meaning the presence of God is wherever you are. That when you leave here today, the presence of God is with you. That when you get in your car, the presence of God is with you. That when you go home this afternoon, the presence of God is with you. At work tomorrow, the presence of God is with you. At school this fall, the presence of God is with you. Therefore, when our focus is on the presence of God, we find joy. There is joy in the presence. There is joy in that presence. But joy doesn't come from possession. It comes from the position. Am I in position to encounter his presence? Am I in position to receive from him? Am I in position to have God speak to me? There's joy, there, there's, there's joy in the purpose, there's, there's joy in the presence. I love what it says here in John chapter 15 as we get ready to close, it says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Then look what it says in verse 12. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. It says that in my presence, your joy is complete. It's not just a little bit of joy. It's not just a, a little, like some joy. No, your joy is complete in the presence of God. He says, when you come to me, your joy is complete. But then I love that it says this, love each other as I have loved you. If you've been around New Hope for a while, here it is. Here's, here's what we say all the time. It's Jesus first, it's others second, and then it's you. And through Jesus, others, and you, we find joy. That when my focus is on the presence of God, there's joy. That when my focus is on others, there is joy. When your focus is on, is on uh, possessions, when you don't get certain things, you won't have joy. When your focus is on being known, when you are unknown, you won't have joy. When your focus is on sports, when your sports team loses, you won't have joy. When your focus is on politics, when things don't go the way you want them to go, you won't have joy. When your focus is on being comfortable, when something inconveniences you, you won't have joy. But when your focus is on the presence of God, there is a well that never runs out. There is joy in the presence of God. When my focus is on the presence, I have joy. When my focus is on loving others, notice it doesn't say by being loved by others, but it's loving others. When my focus is on Jesus and my focus is on loving others, there I have joy. There is joy. Where is your focus today? Where is your mindset today? What is set before you today? Because what is set before you, what your focus is on, determines your joy. Would you stand with me all across the room this morning? I believe today that God wants to pour out some joy on some people. Maybe you came in today and you've been carrying a burden. You came in today and you've been going through a season, you've been going through a trial, and your focus has been on that trial. Your focus has been on how can I get myself out of this? And today, I believe God's calling you to say, just focus on me. Just focus on my presence. When you're in my presence, I take care of the rest. God, I want, God wants to pour out joy today. Maybe you came in today and you've just been going through a season of a feeling down, a feeling out, a feeling depressed. I believe God wants to pour out joy today when we set our focus on Him. So with, with me all across the room, would you just raise your hands all across the room today? And let's just begin to set our mind on God. Let's begin to set our focus on His presence. I believe that His presence is here, that God wants to speak to you, that God wants to move, that God wants to have an encounter with you right now, and our focus right now is gonna be on Him. Our focus right now is gonna be on saying, I just want you, God. I don't want my focus to be on possessions or status or, or things. My focus is on you, God. And in that, I have joy. That when my focus is on the presence of God, that I receive the presence of joy. We thank you, God, that your joy is in this place. We thank you, God, that you are speaking, that you are moving, that your presence is here. And I pray today that we'd feel that presence. I pray today that we would encounter you. Come on, church, let's worship him for a moment today.